Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of Seoul's 2023 webinar series featuring presentations on ecological land care. My name is Julia. I am a board member with Seoul, and I'm happy to be your host today. I live in Ottawa, the unceded territor territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Seoul's webinar series are held every two weeks on Tuesdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. This month's theme is Indigenous-led and inspired land stewardship. You can find all of the themes for the series as well as the registration information on Seoul's website. This episode is being recorded and will be available afterwards on Seoul's website and YouTube channel. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that this webinar series and much of Seoul's work is made possible by the generous support of Gaia College, Canada's leading college for professional development and diploma courses in organic land care. Seoul is also supported by its members, so if you haven't become a member, I invite you to do so. At the end of the presentation, we will have 15 minutes or so for discussion. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Now, I'd like to introduce Grace Wampold, the Community Food Liaison for Collingwood Neighborhood House and Manager of the Norquay Food Forest. Grace is from New Jersey, traditional Lenape Lenape Hoking land, but currently residing on Mesquiam, Squamish, and Seltwetuth territory. <laughs> I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> it's no big deal. We will also revisit that um, in our land acknowledgement. Um, but yes, my name's Grace. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I also just wanted to start, um, I've said this earlier to, it's Julia, right? Is your name? Julia? Yes, Julia. Yes, okay. so this is Julia to Julia earlier, but I'm in a shared office space, so people might walk behind me. Um, I also have my dog with me whose nose you might just saw. So if there's any weirdness that happens or my headset gets pulled off, that's probably why. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to start by recognizing the lands that this food forest is on. Um, the Norquay food forest lives and grows on the traditional and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, still to this day, these communities protect and steward our forests and our waterways, and they've done so for millennia immemorial. We're very proud to carry forward these traditions um, in ceremony and in solidarity with the host nations. So we work very closely um, with uh, members of the host nations to um, take care of these lands, to um, show the power and majesty of our native plant species um, and share that knowledge. So I'll share a little more with you about that as we go into this. Um, but it's really important to acknowledge how all of our, we wouldn't be here today without the work of our host nations. Um, I work for Collingwood Neighborhood House. So on the left, you can see that's our main logo for the Collingwood Neighborhood House. And then within Collingwood, there's a food program. So that's Renfrew Collingwood Food Justice. Um, and we have a few different branches. We have food distribution, we have land-based work, um, and we also have some systems change in our department as well. But we also work with many different partner organizations, including OceanWise, um, Red Fox, Grandview Woodland Food Connection, um, the Mayan Gardens, Talak at the UBC Farm, the Vancouver Urban Food Forest, Ancestral Foodways, the Working Group for Indigenous Food Sovereignty, the Late Indigenous Freedom Food, and Freedom School. So I just wanted to acknowledge those people because we couldn't do any of the work we do without our partnerships, um, without the knowledge keepers um, in our community, bringing forward that, that knowledge, sharing it to the next generation as well. So I just wanted to highlight all of these amazing orgs if you want to um, learn more about them. Um, why do we have our food forest? So um, as a brief history of the space that we get to play on and work on and steward, um, our Norquay food forest actually resides on top hidden headwaters. So all of Vancouver, as we know it today, used to be a series of streams, not just the Fraser River. Um, there was many different streams that were essentially covered up during um, colonization in the last hundred years. Um, but of course, water water likes to make its own path. It's very difficult to tell water where to go. So um, the headwaters um, from Still Creek create a high water table and they couldn't construct a house at 2732 Horley Street, which is where basically a 33 by 120 square foot property um, with a house on either side of it, it just couldn't be 
couldn't be built on. So neighbors at first planted different orchard trees. There was plum trees, apple trees, um, a cherry tree, and of course, Himalayan blackberry. Um, and over time, the city decided to grant that space to the non to us, a nonprofit, the Neighborhood House, Collingwood Neighborhood House, um, so that we could do a permaculture design course. Um, and it's amazing. It's a really, it's a dipped space that many community members have brought soil to to make it a little bit more um, accessible because it was a very deep slope due to that headwater. Um, and as you can see, the, the connecting streams on um, on this image here. The blue is actually daylighted streams and the star is at the Renfrew Ravine and our location is just a little bit south of that star. Um, so who is it for? The food forest is open to everyone. It's technically open 24 seven because it's an open property. Um, it's not gated, there's no locks, um, but we do especially support indigenous black people of color and their access to medicine seeds. Um, coming from this space. It's very difficult and in fact it's illegal to harvest indigenous plant medicines from park space and so we're very privileged actually to not be a park. We are a property that is stewarded so we have the privilege of saying if you want to take some cuttings, if you want to take some rhizomes from these plants to start your own indigenous garden or seeds or even petals, medicines, like you're welcome to take what you need. It's also um, with that a free gathering space. So you don't need to pay any money if you do want to do some organizing and you need a space for organizing, you can come to the food forest. Um, and it's it's open to any groups who who can't access it otherwise for whether that be activist work or just like celebration. Um, so with that, though, our pedagogy is that in indigenous people, indigenous people hold their knowledges. So I myself, um, I'm a settler here. I'm not going to be leading a lot of um, the projects, but I do help support them, and I'm on site um, helping to uphold um, our pedagogies. But that, as far as knowledge is related to native plants, food, and medicine, that belongs to the host people of this space. Um, you do not need to be Indigenous, of course, to participate, um, but you do need to respect host people's directions um, and their processes and their ceremony um, because a lot of thought have, has gone into it. Um, and learning these practices, of course, being part of this and in community with these practices does not mean that you can like teach or pass on these knowledges necessarily unless um, you are within that community and passing it down generationally. Um, we are still guests and to be a good guest means to be a learner and, and to acknowledge those things, but we will not be experts because I don't have um, 10 immemorial generations behind me to uphold that knowledge in my heart and in my body. Um, so for us, when it comes to thinking about food forest, I wanted to say that we are not just only focusing, of course, on the people. When we say indigenous plants, when we say indigenous, we're also referring to the animals. We're also referring to the plants. So we like to serve all the community members in our neighborhood. Um, we're also serving the animals. We're creating safe spaces for birds to nest, safe spaces for coyotes to den. Um, and maybe too safe a space for a rat to get a meal. That happens a lot. <laughs> um, and of course, we're serving the plants. So a lot of native plants, um, especially in our region, are often overtaken by more advantageous species like the Himalayan blackberry or buttercups or marigolds, morning glories that have come in. Um, so we're doing our best to remove any plants that maybe are too advantageous so that we can give indigenous plants um, spaces to thrive and grow and be prolific as they once were in this land and, and are in many different regions of this land that are still stewarded by our indigenous hosts. Um, and so a lot of work we're doing is restoring the space, um, removing non-native plants, um, reintroducing native species, and having drop-in volunteers. So as you see on the far left, that's a photo of us taking, that's all Blackberry. We removed literally two tons. That's from 2021 season. Um, we also do art-based restorations. That was a big focus last season was um, redoing our benches and painting them with different species that are in the forest. Um, we have a seed library 
And that allows the neighbors to come and grab whatever seeds they need. We have seed packets. We'll take some seeds from the space and put them into smaller packets, or we get big donations and we can share them with community who maybe want to dabble in gardening. Um, it's kind of funny though, that space, some community members put books there, some people put puzzles. Um, we promote community members using spaces like how they want to, while it's supposed to be a seed library, we acknowledge that some people are gonna put books and that's fine too. Um, and then we also run workshops, um, medicine harvesting, cooking classes, celebration. So acknowledging tomorrow is Indigenous Peoples Day. We'll have a celebration on Thursday. Um, yesterday was Juneteenth, which is very um, important in America for emancipation of um, Black Americans at the time, um, enslaved people. Um, and we also do other events, like last year we did Diwali, which is the Festival of Lights. So that's for, um, for Indian, for Indian from India people um, sharing um, their different traditions around light and spaces. So having celebrations for anyone in the neighborhood, we have a strong Filipino population, Latin American population, Indian population in, um, in our neighborhood. So we do acknowledge all of the different identities and wanna celebrate all of them when we have time and space for that. So this is an, a list of a little bit of a map of the garden. Um, it's actually been further updated by our summer staff this year. This was last year's map. Um, and as you can see, we have a lot of different uh, different residents. So initially we had just cherry tree, two plum trees, a blackberry bush and a laurel tree on the site. Um, and now we have a plethora of native plants, fruits, nuts, berries. So there's skunk cabbage, hazelnuts, camas was planted recently, a big patch of thimbleberry that had a really great harvest this year, salmonberry pawpaw tree that we found in the back that unfortunately does not have a mate, um, a mulberry tree, snowberry, yarrow, goldenrod. So some of these plants are food. Um, it is a food forest, but we also have dying plants such as twin berries, um, also goldenrod is really great for plant for dying. Um, so some medicines can kind of move between food and um, food or fiber or fodder kind of is how we see it. Um, yeah, it's a really lovely space. It's very cool um, even in the summer because of how shaded it is. Um, and there's benches in the center so that um, around a canoe garden that has been put in that's a four directional canoe garden with the four sacred medicines. So that's a bit about us. And now I'm going to move into more about why we really support food forests, why I think they're such an amazing um, component in climate resilience, in community building, um, and for land management, especially in an urban environment. I love food forests. So the three main points I want to cover are connecting us to decolonial and climate resilient alternatives to land management, creating refuge um, for human and non-human animals, especially in urban environments, um, and producing nourishment medicine for community. So nourishment is not just what you eat. Nourishment is how you feel, um, your connection to culture, your connection to community. Um, so that's why I say mental and physical nourishment. So look at this big cornfield. <laughs> they connect us to, to colonial, decolonial and climate alternatives to land management. So most of our land uh, looks a lot like this. Most of our food, our food lands across North America look like this. Big fields that have nothing but corn, maybe soybeans or alfalfa predominantly grown to feed cows that then go to feed community. Um, a lot of these seeds are hybridized. You cannot save them. You have to purchase them. Um, and in reality, we don't, we don't eat like this. We don't eat fields of corn. We eat a very diverse diet. Um, if you think about corn, ancestrally corn is many many different things but to this day we only have pretty much one seed being shared and in an indigenous perspective of corn it's that it's this is um this is all the different varieties that of the incan people um that corn is a staple food and we have all this diversity we, there's over like a thousand different varieties of it but most of us think of this one yellow cob of corn um 
where diversity really is our strength. If we are looking to grow like this, we're, we have a risk of massive die off. But if we're growing corn for every different use, um, corn has is something that is really special to, um, to a lot of people I work with that certain types of corn are only for soup. Certain types of corn are only for tortillas. Certain types of corn are for your tamales. And each one has a different story. And when you lose that to one type of corn, you also lose that cultural knowledge. You lose the, the stories and the mythologies of your ancestors when you lose that diversity. Um, and you also lose climate resilience. If that crop fails, you're, you're pretty much no longer you're kind of mess. You're pretty screwed. <laughs> um, and the food system contains far more than our grocery store has to offer, right? So when we think about berries, we think about raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, that's what you get in your frozen berry mix. But when you have a local food system, you start to see that you can find there's much more nuance. We have black cap raspberries, thimbleberries, trailing berries, salal. This isn't even an exhaustive list. Um, what you see below you, I think there's a, there's a bunch that are, are missing from even just our local berries, that in reality, we think that if we grow food, we're not going to have the variety if we're growing food for ourselves. But the land that we live on produces a lot of food, and we require a rainbow to survive. We don't live off of just corn and soybeans. We live on a diversity of colors, textures, of minerals and flavors um, that indigenous food can offer us if we plant it and maintain it. That's climate resilience. If we only plant blackberries and raspberries, not only are we not meeting our nutritional needs, but we have a serious risk of um, massive crop failure. Um, so I wanted to also highlight a local tour group, um, Tala Say's Talking Trees, um, and they also talk about before colonization, many indigenous people operated in a food forest, um, especially in our region. So ancestors would ancestors would live in long houses in our our rainforest here, um, and basically they would keep in proximity highly managed um, food forest lands. So with berries, greens, fruits just around their long house in within the forest, um, the predominantly cedar forest. So when settlers came here, they thought they found Eden. They saw these beautifully managed forests and thought that this was a you know part of their manifest destiny that they'd be given this God-given land. But actually, it's been highly managed for generations. Um, that's a story in particular from the Gary Oaks forests of the islands of what is today now known as um, Victoria or Vancouver Island um, that had Gary Oaks and camas bulbs. So just these purple flowers for as far as the eye could see, but that was their cultural traditional crop that they were able to trade with other um, indigenous communities. Um, and they worked very hard to grow those camas bulbs. It wasn't just something that had been plopped there by a god. It was something that we all collectively worked towards with in working in solidarity and in community with the plants of that region. Um, we are part of nature. We can manage nature in a way that is reciprocal between humans and non-humans. Um, if you don't think of it as just um, a means to nutrition, a means for survival, there are so many ways that when you live in a food forest, you're creating um, long-lasting relationships um, with your community of both plants, animals, and other humans in that space. So I liked this image here. Um, of what it really looks like to live in reciprocity and community with um, plants. How do you see you have the mycorrhiza below the surface, you have the interactor here like a rodent, you have people who trade. So bees and birds, for example, trading pollen with plants so that plants can um, plants can produce fruit and that the birds can then produce honey to live a next generation, right? So that symbiosis is something that we're involved in. We're not separate from symbiosis with nature. We're not this separate entity. We are very much embedded in that system. Um, yeah, and I think that's, and the system in of itself, as it says here, is a teacher. So I just wanted to share that. Um, here's another example of um, 
a symbiosis in growing. So in traditional plant knowledges that we also support. So three sisters crops is a good example. Growing a diversity of crops in a small space, not a field of corn. You have your corn, your beans, and your squash. And together under the soil, they all take up different niches in that. So food forests are all about layering and niches filling your gaps, right? You have your high trees, you have your shrubs that lean on your high trees, you have your vining plants that go up of up those plants. Um, and then under the, of course, underneath that, you have the root system. Some roots are wide, some roots are deep, some are tap roots that go really deep. Um, and you really need all of those things to have a healthy system to maintain your topsoil. So that's, this to me is a climate resilient solution and it's also indigenous plant knowledge. Um, another one that, um, another really interesting garden that we have, there's Strathcona Garden in Vancouver, so I just wanted to kind of point this example, Chinampa Gardens are using um, the waterways you have um, to kind of, which creates like a watering system for your plants, and this is another way that Chinampa was usually either used with three sisters um, or um, or also in, in certain cases just for maize um, and willow bark. So willow, of course, holds a lot of water and soil. So it can it can give and reduce. It can give it can pull water when there's too much and then give water back to other plants as well. So it's a really interesting tree. Um, and you can also do willow fences. They um, help create create um, they act as like a, a root stimulant. So if you take willows and you have a plant that needs to new new roots, you can put it in a in a willow solution and help to promote root growth. Um, so there's a there's a our coordinator is actually an expert in Chinampas gardening, um, and we have a lot of water. So I also wanted to point to that because in many ways we we never water our food forest. Our food forest is self watered because we have that headwater. Um, part two: climate resilience, um, creating refuge for humans and non human anim animals. Um, so how do we prevent heat related death in an urban environment that's been a big question for our community in the last three years as we've seen massive heating um we now have you know we're getting over 30 degree days sometimes in the summer in vancouver which isn't that hot for other cities but for us especially with our latitude um can be detrimental we have it's far more dangerous to be in a heat in extreme heat than extreme cold. Um, and as you can see, so if you don't know Vancouver, um, this area to our left is Point Grey. You have a lot more single family homes. Um, of course, this dark blue here is Shaughnessy. That's where there are million dollar, multi-million dollar homes, tens of million dollar homes. And then you have the downtown east side, which is um, a place that is highly policed. Um, has been where during the 2008 Olympics, many of our unhoused neighbors were pushed to and forced to, where overdose prevention is um, essentially maintained and kept only there in that part of the city. Um, and there's no trees. It's like a highly urban area and the risk of heat death is extremely high in that area. And you can see as you go farther west, a lot of it is more industrial. Um, but this little area here that I've circled is our food forest. Um, there's the headwater of the Renfrew Ravine, and then our food forest is um, is in the like light blue color. So it actually is um, much, much cooler than most other urban environments and every area around it, which I found interesting that you have all these like bright red and then just our little our little dot of blue, our little island. <laughs> um, so clearly, just to go to show that um, it's a really, if for humans, if you go to a space like this, if you have tree coverage, you're far less likely to succumb to heat related death if you have access to trees and plants. Um, and additionally for animals, I wanted to express um, the corridor, the idea of safe, safely getting to another food source. So in an urban environment, you have gardens, we have community gardens, um, but sometimes they're fragmented um, through urbanization we fragment our land through roads through housing developments through industry and animals come up with creative solutions so here you have a bird um, a dove nesting on um, a camera which is obviously considered you know an abnormal behavior um, 
And if you look at a city, so if you were imagining yourself as a bee and you were in a little garden over here and you were pollinating your trees as you go, bloop, 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 and then suddenly you hit this highway, you're a tiny little bee. You might not make it over this highway. You might not even know that there's a tree on the other side. You might be stuck to this little area because you don't have a safe passage to get to um, the next, the next um, foraging site. So a food forest and connecting food forests and having connected forested land is very important for the wildlife that you interact with. Even in an urban space, you know, we have coyotes, we have rats, we have birds, we have bees, we have so many animals that were here long before us as us humans, um, especially at this, you know, this degree um, that deserve a safe passage to receive food. There's a lot of complaints from North Vancouver of bee of, bur of <laughs> bears coming into their property, um, bears rooting in trash, but that goes to show that there's no there's fewer, there's fewer forested spaces left for them. And even that, when there are forested spaces, they have to cross through human-centered spaces to, to get to their next forage site. So making sure that you have food forests or passage for animals so that we can have safe interactions, so that bears, for example, can go over highways and not create, you know, six-lane traffic. Um, so that they can receive, they can access the foods they need. So this is an example of a highway that has put an overpass for animals to safely cross um, across. This is like just, I think, a like a 3D rendering image. Um, but I think it's something that a lot more people are talking about as a as a solution to land fragmentation. Um, and part three, nourishment. So I just thought I'd show you a bunch of different photos of what we do. Um, we have our salal up here, um, salal berries. We have our thimbleberry, our blueberry, and our salmonberry. So here are some plums. We, we were able to harvest about like 50 pounds of plums from this one little pl prune plum tree. Um, and the day we harvested that, there were we were just sitting and one neighbor saw us harvesting and said, is it okay if I have some? And we said, of course. And they ran away. They came back with a bucket and this four-year-old boy and his father climbed the tree, threw the bucket over, made a little like, pulley system and were pulling down buckets and grandmas from the neighborhood saw and we were distributing plums to the grandmas of the neighborhood. And they were like, we're going to make cakes and plum cakes. Um, that family was from the Netherlands and they said they had a traditional family plum cake recipe that they would make. And just that moment, just having access to food um, and freely saying, yes, you can take it, which is so abnormal, especially in urban garden spaces. We were able to create these really strong connections. Suddenly all these people who never met were interacting with one another and just feeling so joyful, um, sharing in the gift of these plums. Um, we also do general like regular celebrations. So coming together and like eating the food that you grew together. There's really no way to explain like the joy that that really brings, um, the gratification that that brings, being able to feed um, those who also taught you. So giving that food up to your elders. Um, and then we had medicine bags. So we had a huge donation of saris actually. So we use um, really nice high quality fabric to do our medicine bundling um, and sharing that gift of doing of flags around the food forest um, to protect yourself. So connecting you to each of the sacred medicines, the history of those plants, um, and then having that protector on your body is like really lovely as well. So be able to take that piece of the food forest with you everywhere you go, even if you're in an overwhelming space, having access to um, grounding centering medicines. There's also drumming that happens in the food forest over the summers. Currently we're working on a carving project. So making masks with children and that'll build up to a totem project. Um, we had a log gifted a huge totem cedar um, that we will be hopefully splitting and um, and then that knowledge will be passed down to crew so that's a youth community a youth group that we have that they do um, canoe club together and carving and other um, traditional knowledges just passing that down within a family setting and then we have a child and family one in Lotsi, so that's for younger kids um, 
ribbon skirt making. Um, so we'll, some of those things may not always happen in the food forest, but then we can bring them to the forest to um, for further celebration, kind of connecting those practices with the space as well. Um, in the bottom left, I have a dear friend of mine, Melissa, and one of her mentors with their medicine bundle and their um, smudge and conch together after they did a lovely cedar um, blessing to everyone who arrived that day. And we did tea making as well. So like learning how to make tea with things you have around you, for example, um, there's sumac which makes a really delicious tea. So harvesting things like that and our mint. Um, and so if you can't really resonate with something like carrying a medicine bundle, maybe actually using that medicine as a tea, which maybe is more something that you can resonate with um, versus burning the medicines. But yeah, there are so many different ways to engage with the food forest. And so depending on where you come from, where, where what your starting point is, I think there's a lot of amazing entry points into um, into healing physically and mentally, like access to this local food and doing the hard work. Sometimes just spending a couple hours, maybe you had a bad day and what you're gonna do is just weed, pulling up blackberries, digging out these blackberry roots, pulling with all of your might to get these blackberry roots out can be very cathartic if you've had um, a stressful life or a stressful week. Um, if you come to the space and you're feeling sad and you want to be sad with the food forest, that's okay. If you're feeling joyful and you want to be joyful in the food forest um, and spread that with the people and the plants around you, that's also amazing. Um, you know, it really is where you are at. Um, that's how you, that's where, that's how you arrive. Um, yeah. So that's all I had for today. This is a little photo of our Diwali event which I mentioned earlier and just the beautiful food forest at dusk and the four-sided canoe garden so you can see our cedar off centered there some sweet grass kind of pushing through it's a little bit floppy but it's gonna it's it's bounced back a bit um and some other plants in there as well but yeah that's everything I have for today <laughs> that was wonderful Grace I think it's um really fascinating seeing the the benefits that a food forest has on heat in a city um, I know yeah. Montreal has done some published some stuff on this as well and I haven't seen very much from any other cities but it's something that I think every every city should be focusing on is having a forest in a downtown area where people people can go and cool down in the middle of a hot day Ottawa we just open cooling centers so all public buildings where there's air conditioning and you can go there and that's really helpful for our climate <laughs> yeah yeah don't we, you oh go ahead <laughs> yeah our neighborhood house is also a cooling center and I think that's funny right like you can have just for the cost of like planting five trees a like a permanent cooling center or paying for air conditioning a building you know putting air conditioning in a building yeah um is yeah so like just balancing that yes is, yes yeah. there's and those, we can uh, only fit so many people in the building you know exactly <laughs> yeah there's a, a public park just across from our city hall and I don't think that that's what they I don't think they push it but the city hall is open if you need to cool down it's <laughs> it's right there <laughs> just plant some more trees <laughs> anyway it's great that there's more more um areas like this so that may be more municipalities will catch on yeah and you know it's not like I said it's not parks land so to be honest a lot of our parks land are still lawns right like mm -hmm. so much of our parks that are supposed to be for those kinds of like natural recreation or even you know healing if you want to go and connect with nature if it's mm -hmm. just grass and a few like perimeter trees you know doesn't cut it you don't have that privacy you don't have um you don't even have that oxygen you don't even have the carbon sequestration so. no <laughs> no there's no benefits to it at all yeah joan did you have any questions for grace i know i just like to say thank you for the really good presentation um i, I only wish that there were more people available to watch it i i'm hoping that there's some that are going to watch it online <laughs> later that maybe are just busy at this particular time slot and, and can't watch it right now I we were actually be discussing before you came on that everyone is probably outside so i'm in ottawa yeah. it's sunny today and we've got a few days of sun and then it's going to be rainy and it was cloudy on the weekend so 
it's it's just that time of year where people don't want to be inside at a screen in the middle of the afternoon. Well, yeah. that's true. But here we have no excuse in Calgary. It's been raining now for I think three <laughs> days. And <laughs> no, we, 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 like the earth needed the water. But for me personally, I need some sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah exactly. I, I did pass on the, the information about the webinar to, uh, to uh, my daughter, who's, who's uh, living in Prince Albert. And mm. I see that she's here today, but I will give her a little poke and tell her that, yeah, you've got to watch this and uh, pass it on to other people because th this this sort of thing really does need to be seen and more people have to get on this yes. kind of a, a project, this kind of an activity because it's there's just something so healing to the soul about being in a garden. Yeah, absolutely. And Even if it's, I mean, a, a lunch break in a park under a tree, as opposed to sitting at a desk and you're outside in nature, it can be so recharging just for 30 minutes in the middle of the day and then going back to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think when we live a life where our feet are always on cement, you, you kind of get disconnected without really understanding what you've disconnected from. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I cannot put it into words that make any kind of logical, rational sense, but uh, I really do feel that to be in a space like space that you guys have built there it is good for one soul and yeah uh, more spaces like that and I think a lot of people especially my generation are very um dejected and scared and worried for how for the systems that we live in um disenchanted by the system but also not sure about like what solutions there are what mm -hmm. other possibilities are there for our food system um but the reality is like for millennia, people were able to, were, there was, there is another solution and that's indigenous plant knowledge, right? Like that we have so much, the land here is so much to offer us um, and ideas like places like food forests, um, permaculture projects, things that show like you can plant more high density foods, high calorie foods, um, get shade, get all of these other um, ecosystem services from planting this way versus traditional agriculture, like what we consider traditional agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, we don't, we don't need to have food shipped in. We can have food right here. Um, and when you have that, when you see that food right in front of you and you understand all of the things that have went into planting it, you probably are going to have more respect for that meal. Um, mm -hmm and more of a healthy relationship to that food that you're eating as well. I mean, it's easy for us to have bad relationships to food because we don't know to be upset about the cost of it because we don't know what went into making it. We don't know how hard it was for those laborers to grow it and to get it to you. Um, but if, if you're in that process, if you're involved in that system, you really understand how much goes into it and how blessed we really are um, to be part of nature in that way. I yeah. think the community sense too, when you're talking about the plums and just sharing that harvest with people in the community and bringing people together so that someone can have some fresh food yeah, and they don't have to go to the store and buy their fresh fruit. They can just get it from the park. I think that's so wonderful and it can have such an impact on society. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of like community plots around the city, those little classic, like I guess three by six, mm -hmm. but I really want to personally like push for fewer three by six plots that are owned by one family and more co-management of those kinds of urban growing spaces where, because if we work together, we can grow a lot more and we can share with a lot more people. Yeah. It's not don't touch. We are very much please touch, please take. That's more of our attitude when it comes to um, our food lands, at least in our team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, hopefully that spreads yeah. <laughs> to all of Vancouver. <laughs> the dream. Yeah. <laughs> someday yeah okay well thank you so much for presenting today this was wonderful and this will be shared on um soul social media channels and we'll put a link on our website so more people can view it and our our videos get viewed so many times we just we look back periodically at the last month and last year and the views just keep going up so people keep either keep coming back and watching them again or they're sharing them and more people are watching them which is great so so thanks very much, Grace, and thank you, Joan, for being our sole participant. And enjoy the rest of your day, both of you. Okay. Take okay. care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.